A very special treat here in Oshkosh was a visit of the tower on Monday, the first day of the event. That was quite something. Turns out the FAA has a lot of other exhibits around the tower. Let me give you a tour. For one week a year, Oshkosh, Wisconsin becomes the busiest airport in the world. In terms of sheer numbers, but also in terms of a diverse mix of aircraft, AirVenture makes the control of this huge event a special challenge. Light general aviation aircraft share the airspace and runways with old historic airplanes, with military jets, and even with airliners. All of this happens under the direction of the so-called pink shirts, the FAA's air traffic controllers which staff the tower and other places at Oshkosh and Fisk to direct traffic. People like Aaron Rausch. Aaron is an FAA operations manager here in Oshkosh. The other 51 weeks of the year she is an air traffic manager in South Bend, Indiana. Aaron met with us outside the tower in Oshkosh to talk about what life is like for the pink shirts here at AirVenture and she starts by explaining how this large group of controllers is organized. Absolutely, so we have 16 teams of four controllers and they rotate through the different positions that we have. So at any given time we have two teams up in the control tower working the north runway 927 or the south runways 36 and 18. Um, we also have a team down on the ground by either 36 or 18 and another one up on runway 927. And then we also have a team at Fond du Lac and a team down at Fisk VFR Approach Control. So we're in a whole lot of different places doing a lot of different air traffic things all happening at once. Um, so they work either a morning shift or an afternoon shift. And so they'll come in, check out the weather for the day and then basically report right to the position they're going to to start working airplanes and keep things moving. Is there constant coordination necessary between here and Fisk and the other places or do you have the equivalent of a letter of agreement that, right. that defines all that? Um... We do have letters of agreement between the different facilities but we do have a lot of coordination especially with the management team, the operations managers in the tower kind of serve as a focal for that as well as the supervisors in the tower. Uh, we use FM radios, just constant coordination, communication, making sure everybody Everybody's on the same page. That's the safest operation when everybody has the same knowledge about what's going on. So a lot of communication back and forth and keeping everybody apprised of what's happening. Right. As a controller, how would you rate the uh, pilots in terms of knowledge of the node and procedure and, and the skills necessary to fly the tight pattern? Um, great. I mean, the, the pilots do a fantastic job. We ask them to do some challenging things, landing on spots, short approaches, different things that they may not get to do at their home airports or may not practice very often. So the pilots do a fantastic job for us. Um, you'll hear it a lot. The controllers try to shout out, you know, thanks for the help, nice spot. You know, they'll try and say encouragement to the pilots because we appreciate what they're doing because they're helping us almost just as much as we're trying to help them every day. Do you um, swap during the day, or is it a day at the end of the runway, a day up here? Day um, or yeah, uh, each day they would be in one location, so if they're on a morning shift in the tower, they'd be in the tower for that day. The next day, though, they might go to Fond du Lac or Fisk or one of the other locations. Okay. One more question. Sure. As far as training before this event, yeah. how far in advance do you start working here, or where do you work? Sure. Uh, I mean, the training really starts as soon as we can get the information to the people we've selected. So um, this year, I believe in May, we sent out our training order. Um, so we send out all the training materials so that way people can start getting familiar with it, learning if there's any changes, anything new, um, and just getting familiar. And so they have time to prepare. And then we actually train the day before all the controllers start working. So they all come up and we spend an entire day just going through all the different procedures of all the different locations that we have just to prepare. And that's all. We'll come back to the tower in a few minutes, but first I want to show you some of the exhibits the FAA had in the Aviation Safety Center, right next to the tower. And I'll start with Chad Brewer and Corey Stevens, who talk about a data collection and analysis system which I think is very interesting, and that each pilot contributing to it can obtain valuable information relative to his or her individual style of flying. So Chad and I work with the uh, General Aviation Joint Steering Committee. Uh, it's made up of different lines of business within the FAA and the general aviation industry and associations. Manufacturers, AOPA, EAA, SAFE, NAPI, NATA. Uh, we all work together to uh, reduce the risk of fatal accidents within general aviation. We identified um, a benefit of developing tools that can help pilots understand um, what risks they may be encountering uh, during their flight by, by analyzing flight data. The flight data can come from a variety of sources, whether it's avionics, like such as a G1000, 
uh, or if you're using a iOS or an Android device, uh, you can you can record data off an, an iPad or uh, an Android tablet or, or an iPhone. As a community, so with those folks that we mentioned earlier, we work together to look for emerging risks to try to mitigate those before they become the next fatal accident. So getting data off the devices is, is fairly simple. Off something like the G1000, a device like the G1000, uh, it's as simple as removing an SD card um, from the uh, PFD. Um, you can take the files, uh, CSV files that come off that, uh, put those into a zip file, either a single flight or multiple flights submit that into the NGA FID and it will automatically process and populate your, your, your dashboard. Um, as we continue uh, this, pro uh, this project, over the next year, we're working on benchmarking across general aviation. So if you'd like to know what your unstabilized approach rate is compared to the broader GA community, you'll be able to tell that from here. Another exhibit showed information about ADS-B. Here's Jamal Wilson talking about getting ready for the 2020 mandate. As far as equipage goes, on the numbers side, we're looking very, very good on equipage. The Part 121 and Part 135 airlines are equipping at a very, very nice clip, and everybody is on schedule or projected to go early on their equipage plans on their fleets for ADSB out equipage. Uh, total numbers right now look like about 93 to 94,000 airplanes in the NASA are equipped. On the GA side of the house, we're looking at approximately 64, 65,000 airplanes that have equipped with many, many other folks making the determination right now as to if they need to equip and if they need to equip what solution would best suit their needs in both uh, airplane interoperability with avionics and uh, airspace needs. On the airspace side of the house, we like to make an important point to aviators that ADSB out is an airspace rule, not an airplane rule. So there are a lot of folks that see the mandate and automatically assume that if they have an airplane, they need to equip, and that's not the case. If you operate above 10,000 feet, if you operate in a mode C veil, or if you operate in or above class C airspace on a regular basis, you may want to give some serious consideration to, consider, to equipping with ADSPL. This leaves a lot of airspace where mode C transponder will still work just fine. It's so one of the most important pieces of information I'll convey is take an objective look at your operation, how you fly and where you fly. Several physicians are also present here in Oshkosh to answer questions pilots may have about their medicals. Here's the FAA's Federal Air Surgeon, Dr. Mike Berry. I just want to talk to you for a very short minute here uh, about some of the problems that you as pilots have in trying to get us the information that we want and the difficulties in sending us information and getting uh, word on what's the status of your case. And I'd like to make the plea at this point that if you are having problems finding out about your case is to call your regional flight surgeon. We have nine regional flight surgeons geographically across the country from Western Pacific to New England uh, that you can find out who they are and what the phone number for that medical office is on the FAA website, FAA.gov. And I highly would recommend that you call your regional flight surgeon to find out about your case, not call Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City may give you an answer, but they are inundated with calls. We've had as many as 50,000 phone calls in one week. So call your regional flight surgeon. And some of the major problems that we deal with in trying to get your records is referenced by a Twitter uh, feed that came out by one of our previous regional flight surgeons who's now in Oklahoma City as a certification physician. So please work with us and don't just assume that we're always going to say no. Thanks. Another exhibit covers the runway safety topic. So pilots have heard from the FAA on runway safety issues for a number of years now. Uh, so some of the new things to talk about in runway safety we're focusing on this year are wrong surface events, which include landing at the wrong airport, landing on the wrong runway, or using a taxiway for departure, or landing by mistake. So we've seen a lot of a lot of those events uh, where parallel runways uh, cause some confusion with their, uh, pilots landing on the left versus the right, or on the parallel taxiway rather than the proper runway. So we've seen a trend in those increasing over the last few months and we're really focusing on those in the summertime. Also, uh, we have issues with aircraft 
departing on intersection departures in the wrong direction, taking the 180 degree turn to the wrong direction and taking off north versus south, for example, that's on the rise as well. Another new item that we have in runway safety is uh, our new runway safety simulator. Um, the simulator is online at runwaysafetysimulator.com. Uh, there's two scenarios where you can work with students to learn your signs and markings, how to use your airport diagram, focus on the importance of the airport diagram, and then get some air traffic instructions and interactively work on whether you should turn left or turn right. Um, at the end of those two simulations, there is an additional video of a scenario that we had where an aircraft did not use the airport diagram, took a wrong turn, and uh, was involved in a near collision on a, a GA airport in our area. So those things are really hot topics right now. I'd also encourage you to go to our website, uh, faa.gov slash go slash runway safety, and we have uh, a lot of information, materials, and things like that uh, for pilots, drivers, and controllers. Now let's go back to the tower. Record rainfall had forced EAA to close the grass parking areas for most of the first weekend. I spoke with Erin on the first full day Oshkosh was open for general aviation again, and I asked her how the controllers had prepared for the sudden rush of traffic. Um, you know, we really, we knew it would be coming. We knew that the demand was there. Even yesterday we had a lot of demand, even with people coming in, just when we opened up in the evening for a limited amount of time. So we expected today to be busy, so we were just ready for that when we came in, um, just ready to handle the aircraft that were coming, working with EAA on the ground and all the volunteers, making sure that we're turning airplanes the correct way to get them in the right places to help support airplanes moving around the airport because we can't get them, if, if we get them off the runways and they don't have anywhere to go, it's that support of the EAA team is just essential to that. Okay. Another question was about the different experience levels controllers in Oshkosh have. And so on each team we have varying levels of experience. So we have our veterans and team leads, so those are people that have been here at least four years. Um, we also have limiteds that have two to three years of experience, and then we have our rookies, who is their first time coming up to the event. So um, we use some seniority and we use based on how much experience people have, and we build teams so that way we can continue to keep new people coming, keep people learning, and keep a fresh just group of people coming up to the event as people move around across the system. What kind of skills do they pick up here that they can take back to where uh, they work? Um, definitely flexibility. Flexibility is something that we really have to use a lot of here. Just in, um, We're really here to serve the pilots and just really make it a good experience while we keep it safe. So flexibility in unusual situations, just being able to adapt quickly to be able to come up with plan C, D, or E after A, B, and C didn't go the way that they were planning they would go. So just really being able to be flexible and honestly really just the um, the atmosphere of camaraderie with their fellow controllers. It's a really positive atmosphere. Everybody's excited to be here, excited to see the other controllers and people and just that positive community type of air traffic control. That's not necessarily a skill, but something that people always take home with them after they've been here. Then we were allowed a few minutes in the tower cab. The view from here is spectacular, as you can imagine. You can see very well here how the controllers work in small teams. Also with the EAA operations in terms of aircraft and a special field Serious ground Cessna, turn your base. Cessna, turn your base now. Tighten it up, Cessna. I need you to descend. I'm getting ready to turn your base. Cessna, turn around the number. Straight by Cessna. Turn around. You've got people doing this up right now. Are you on that? Are you on that? Pass down. I even spotted my Bonanza from up here, parked in the North 40. That concludes our tour, and I already look forward to hearing this in my radio again next year. <laughs> Welcome to Oshkosh, rock your wings, good rock, thank you. <laughs>
A big thank you to all the controllers and everybody else from the FAA here in Oshkosh. I hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, I appreciate a like and a subscribe from you. It helps me grow the channel and make more videos. Fly safe, and see you next time!